So moving on to some health facts, less than half of us, especially Americans, breathe through our noses. We're mostly, mostly mouth breathers and essentially mouth breathing is panting. So we're walking around panting all day long. <laughs> um, here I have listed a few of the disorders that are made worse by mouth breathing. And a lot of people think that they breathe through their mouth because they have sleep apnea, when in reality, you get sleep apnea because you are a mouth breather. It will make your asthma worse. It'll make your blood pressure go up. It will affect your sexual function for both women and men. It can trigger ADHD or make it worse. So you may not even have symptoms of ADHD or your child may not even have symptoms, but through chronic mouth breathing, those symptoms can be triggered, mostly because we're starving the frontal lobe of, of oxygen that it needs to actually help us make good sound decisions. Um, it will affect your dental health. You, it will change the shape of your mouth, shrinking your mouth so that we don't have the amount of space that we need for our teeth. And then that's why we have to do things like get our wisdom teeth pulled. It's also worse for cavities than actual sugar. So mouth breathing has a bigger effect on your cavities than, than consuming lots of, and I'm not saying run out and eat all the candy and drink all the soda, but the bigger effect is actually breathing through your mouth. And some, and cancer is also made worse when the body is not alkaline or has enough oxygen. So cells that may not, um, which is essentially cancer, it's just cells that don't produce properly and they produce too rapidly, essentially being wrong. So if your body is starved of oxygen, then you aren't going to be able to uh, produce healthy cells and that will both make cancer worse or even trigger cancer. And these are just some of the things that um, your that your health is affected by, that affects your health by um, mouth breathing. And to add to that memory, your energy levels, the quality of your sleep, even if you don't have sleep apnea, your ability to gain or lose weight is also affected by um, by how much good air you're getting. In addition, mouth breathing leads to a weaker soft palate. So then that's how we end up with snoring, sleep apnea, and not being able to rest properly. And then, and then we're prescribed a CPAP, which is always tons of fun to wear. In fact, some cultures um, need it so much or respect it so much that when they have infants after they're done feeding, mostly breastfeeding, mothers will gently press the lips of their babies together so that they get in the habit of nostril breathing instead of mouth breathing. All right. There's a, um, there are some suggestions because we are not used to and even like I know better, I've known better for years and getting ready for this presentation, I have learned that um, I can't, I don't nose breathe as much as I should. So it's really important to do things to make the effort to be conscious of whether or not you're nose breathing. So I have now started taking time out into my day, during my day, just to make sure that I'm taking a few full solid nostril breaths so that I'm not so that I'm aware because it's important to be present and aware. We think, and I'm gonna get into it later, that breathing is automatic, that we don't have to pay attention to it. And that is true, but it's also not true because you're gonna get the best quality by being aware of what you're actually doing. You're gonna breathe slower, you're gonna breathe better, and you're gonna have more oxygen even though, or more air even though you think it, it sounds like less because you're breathing slower and less, but the quality is better. Can you do me a favor and get my book bag? I'm running out of battery. <laughs> of course. So here's a little fun fact. If you spread out your lungs, they're the size of a tennis court with the right lung too, because that's where our heart sits. So we have a massive amount of space to take in good quality breaths and enhance our memories 
uh, improve our sports or our sporting abilities because if you're breathing through your nose when you're running, you're getting better quality of air. So you can go further, your endurance is improved for starters. So I thought that was pretty cool that we could lay out our lungs across a, um, a tennis court. The lungs are also the only human organ that floats, probably because they contain air when others don't. <laughs> um, they also help to create your voice. So obviously the inhaling and exhaling of, uh, of the air from your lungs is what determines or what dictates how strong your voice is. In Chinese medicine, we have always made that association where if you have somebody speak softly all the time or their voice is very weak, then we view it as a weak, oh, excuse me, a weak lung chi. So there's a strong correlation with the strength of your lungs and the strength of your voice. And the lungs don't actually expand and contract. It's the organs around them and under them, namely the diaphragm, which expands and contracts, which pulls the lungs down or presses them up for our, for our exhale. So the really cool thing is that if you take a deep breath, the diaphragm comes down a little bit and gives your liver a little massage. So every time you take a deep breath, it's like a mini mood booster which is also super cool because if you're not feeling great, if you've had a rough day, just three deep breaths not only gets you more air into your lungs, which in turn triggers a mood change, you massage your liver, which also, in, um, uh, also triggers a mood change. So that's really cool. Here are some interesting facts. Um, Poor breathing may even contribute to some form of cancer, like I mentioned earlier. In fact, Dr. Otto Warburg won the Nobel Prize in 1931 for determining that oxygen cells starts, oxygen starved cells are what cause cancer. So, like I said earlier, if your body is alkaline and you have enough oxygen in your cells, cancer is not a thing that can exist in your body. And it's such a hard, it's such a hard disease to cope with that any kind of prevention that we can do is really important. So like I said before, breathing, we're a lot of times taught that breathing is automatic. And it is, it happens even if you are not intending to, your body is going to try to breathe. But the best breaths are somatic, which is intentional. On average, people take about 16 breaths per minute, mostly because we're panting. Um, but 5.5 breaths or five and a half to six breaths is actually the most ideal um, breath pace if you want to trigger your parasympathetic uh, nervous system. So in, where in order to be in a state of being calm, cool, collected, clear thought, you want to take slower, longer, deeper breaths so that your body can actually and it's the CO2 that your body is usually utilizing more than the oxygen, which I'm going to get to in two points. Um, our, nose, our noses, our nostrils naturally, naturally alternate dominance. What this means is that we have what is called a nasal cycle. Part of the time, and this alternates about every 90 minutes, part of the time your right nostril will be dominant and you will get most of your air from the right side. And then the right side will kind of congest a little bit and your left side will open. This is a natural and, no, and healthy breathing cycle. So obviously if we have a cold or we're having allergies, that cycle's not gonna work as well. It's still gonna be occurring, but because we're already congested, you're just gonna notice that you're more congested in one nostril than the other, as opposed to being able to take in more air from one than the other. And that's really cool because we're gonna actually learn to do some alternate nostril breathing, which is gonna teach you how to slow your body down and utilize the air better. Air is 21% oxygen. Our body only needs about 5%. The rest of our breath is consumed, or most of the rest of our breath is taken up by carbon dioxide. And that's what's really important because they've done some studies that pump in high levels of oxygen into animal tanks or up the nostrils of dogs, and they don't do well. When you have a high oxygen content, they actually see a lot of organ failure and the animals have serious health ramifications that I don't want to get into here because it makes me sad when the oxygen level is too high. But the minute they change that and they start to increase the levels of carbon dioxide, the animals return to normal. Their heart rates go back to normal. They aren't suffering. They're essentially 
hyperoxygenated in one way. And when we have enough carbon dioxide, that's what allows our blood vessels to open up and dilate so that we can get more, more air into us and better utilize it. And for those of you who care about detoxing, 70% of our waste is exhaled through our lungs. So if you're taking big, like I keep saying, deep, solid breaths, slow breaths, you're actually expelling way more waste from your system than by going on a fiber diet. <laughs> oh, as I mentioned before with the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide is what actually alkalizes the body. And you want to, um, a healthy body ranges between 6.8 and 7.2 on the pH scale. And anything under that, it just is a breeding ground for disease and disorder and injury. And then, so you want to be right around 6.8 to 7.2. The most, the more carbon dioxide you take in, the more alkaline your body is going to be. Now, this isn't an end-all be-all. You can't drink soda all day and eat cake all week and then just take three really deep breaths and alkalize your body. But it is going to contribute to, um, have it, to maintaining a healthy body. Okay, so now we're going to take a second to learn the three-part breath. The easiest way to do it is lying down, but since most of us are at work, I don't encourage you to kick your shoes off and lay on the floor just yet. So we're gonna learn it seated. And the first thing you wanna do is you wanna place a hand on your belly and a hand on your chest. And you wanna take a nice, big, deep inhale. You wanna first inhale your belly, feel that belly expanding, then allow the breath to fill up your chest once the belly is full. From the chest, you're gonna move that breath into the throat until you cannot possibly take in that one more little bit of air before beginning to exhale everything from your throat, emptying your chest, dumping into the belly, and then gently squeeze belly button to spine to get any last bit of oxygen air, oxygen out, to be, and then repeating the cycle. This is a great way to meditate. So if you want to take up meditation but don't know how, this is a great start. But doing a belly breath is the first, it's the first breath that you want to do before any breathing meditation or breathing ritual or breathing routine because it just kind of centers the body. It makes sure that you're present in your breath like we talked about, not just going on autopilot, but actually being present in what you're doing. And then making sure that you're actually use, utilizing the full tennis courts worth of space that you have in your lungs. So I hope that you'll take that and you'll do it at least every day for two minutes, just some three part breaths. That's a definitely a good start. It's a way to start. It's a great way to start your day. It's a great way to end your day. And it's a great thing to do right after lunch. So there's really no excuse why we can't all be doing three part breaths. So I want to get into a little bit our two endocrine systems. So we have sympathetic, for those of you that don't know, sympathetic is related to your stress reactions, your fight, flight, or flee reaction. It's automatic. It leads you to make shallower breaths, and it puts your endocrine system on pause. This happens because when you are in a sympathetic state, your body is trying to survive. So many, many, many moons ago when we were running from mammoths and saber twos or even wolves, we needed this system. We still need this system, but we needed this system to pause everything, clear out the mind and get us running or get us protecting ourselves, our family, our land or whatever it was that we needed to protect so that we would not die. Great system. We need this. However, the body can't tell the difference between running from a mammoth and a bad day at work, a boss who's yelling at you, a deadline that's coming on quickly. So it doesn't matter what the stressor is, you are going to have the same response. So if you're having a bad day at work, your endocrine system is going to go on pause. And for those of you that don't know, that is your ability to metabolize your sugar and fat your ability to produce male or female hormones, your pituitary glands, your thyroid hormones, all of that goes on pause, gets interrupted, because the only thing that matters is you not being dead in that moment. 
But like I said, the body can't tell the difference between an actual physical threat and a threat because you're overwhelmed, overloaded, and overworked. Then we have our, parasymp our parasympathetic state, which is the state that we want to mostly be in because realistically, we're not running from anything. We're not trying to survive every day. We live in a society where COVID isn't great, but at least it's not somebody trying to break in your home and hurt your family. So we want and we can rest and digest. So your hormones are working, you're, you're utilizing your, your nutrients properly from your food, and you're able to take slow, deep breaths so that all of your systems function. So think of your breath as the first line, the first line of dominoes. If you're not doing that right, everything else is going to fall as well. If you have it upright, solid, and strong. So shallow breathing, when you're only breathing into your chest and you're not breathing all the way into your belly, it can, so fight or flight can trigger shallow breathing or shallow breathing can trigger a state of fight or flight. So you're just not breathing all the way into your belly, your body is going to start to have all the react, gonna have a harder time focusing on getting your things done. You're gonna have a harder time getting through um, all of your activities because you'll become forgetful. You will get lightheaded. You might get a headache. Your front needs, so we're not making the best decisions. So a few more facts. Our nose is a filter that's lined with tiny hairs that protect the body from 20 billions of particles of 20 billion particles of foreign matters daily. That is a lot of dirty stuff going up your nose and my nose. It's not ew, but it's super important. And that's part of why we need to be nose breathers because our mouth doesn't have that filter system. So our nose is filtering out bacteria, allergens, viruses, just gunk that can make you sick. Our mouth does not have that filter. So the minute you start pant breathing, or panting, you you lose one your very first line of defense in your immune system, and you're more likely to end up with things like stress, uh, strep, chronic sore throats, the need to have your tonsils removed because your tonsils are not meant to filter all the garbage they're having to filter. Also, your nose moisturizes the air. Make sure. <laughs> and your mouth doesn't. So when you moisturize the air, you actually stay better hydrated, you have a better sense of smell. When you are mouth breathing, the air gets much more dry and then that's how you end up with that dry throat. You're overall more dehydrated. It's, we're not designed, we can do it, but we're not designed to, to breathe through our mouths. Smell is also the only sense that is directly connected to the area of the brain where memories are formed and emotions are processed, which I thought was really cool because smells can take us back to people, places, times, um, experiences, and it's directly linked to your brain. So I think that's fantastic. Um, we, we rely a lot on our vision and we don't really appreciate how important scent in our nose is. I've gotten a whole other appreciation by taking, by prepping for this, for this talk and doing even more details that are doing more research and seeing how much, exactly how important our nose is, not just for breath, but for so many things. And if you think back, it's easy to remember your mom's perfume or Thanksgiving dinner or your first new car or uh, your favorite cookies that your grandma used to make. It's so easy to pull up those memories and you can almost still smell. And once you can smell it, people can actually start to taste it, but it doesn't usually work in the reverse. And because smell is directly related to the um, emotions and memories, this is why aromatherapy is such a, a strong therapy. Uh, aromatherapy is such a strong therapy because the, that close relation, that close link allows us to use aromatherapy, not just for pain or decongesting or headaches, but it allows us to cope with things like grief 
or depression because we're able to alter our moods by using scent. And I talked about this a little bit earlier where we talked about the nasal cycle and how a healthy nose will alternate about every 90 minutes um, in, from one nostril to the other where it's dominant. And I just wanted to share a little bit about what each nostril, the relation of each nostril has. So when most of us know that the opposite side of the brain relates to the opposite side of the body. So your left nostril affects your right side of the brain. That's where your creativity centers uh, are located. That's where your emotions are. Um, it affects your daydreams. And um, it's very calming when you're breathing in through the left nostril. It's a yin situation, which, or it's yin, which is nurturing, female, passive, resting. And then we have our right nostril, which controls the left side of the brain, which is all about movement and energy and logic and reasoning and language. And you can get your, in, your heart rate up this way, which is great. Sometimes we want to increase our heart rate and it's yang related. So like I said, it's active, it's movement, it's warming. Um, yang is masculine, yin is feminine, and yin is related to the earth where the yang is related to heaven. So we're going to learn our third breathing our third breathing technique. And this is called alternate nostril breathing or Nadi Shadana in, in Sanskrit with the, with when we're teaching it in yoga. So what you want to do is you want to do like a, almost like you're surfing that kind of symbol and you want to use your pinky, nope, excuse me, your thumb to cover your right nostril. And you want to Inhale through your left nostril. Nice, slow, deep inhale. And then cover the op your left nostril and exhale through your right nostril. Always bringing belly button to spine so that you can get that last bit of air out. Then what you wanna do is inhale through the same right nostril and exhale through the left nostril. So you're going to inhale, Swap nostrils, exhale, inhale, swap nostrils, exhale. This is a really great exercise for, it literally means, Nadi means channel, and Shodana means purification. So we're purifying all of our channels. This, this breathing technique clears and releases toxins, balances both sides of the brain, reduces stress and anxiety, calms the nervous system, helps balance your hormones. It can actually, um, it can help with relieving the allergies, although I suggest that pinching the nose and shaking the head up and down is done first so that you can actually do the alternate nostril breathing without being so congested that you can't breathe at all. It also fosters mental clarity, alertness, and focus. So mostly because you're balancing the two sides and they're not um, fighting for dominance in your brain, which usually happens because we have so much going on. We believe that we can multitask. So we have these to-do lists in our head. And instead of focusing on the one project, we have one side of the brain focusing and the other side saying, but what about this? Or what about this? Or what about this? And when you do the alternate nostril breathing, it quiets the peanut gallery and allows you to really focus on the project that you have right in front of you instead of worrying about everything else. And I went through this really fast. So that is my presentation. I'm Jennifer. I'm at Acupuncture, Acupuncture and Natural Therapies. We're over here in Carrollwood. And this is what we do. Meditation, breathing, acupuncture, all the things you need. Do you have any questions? There were a lot of questions. Um, I think Diane, Peter, and Steve all had questions for you. Okay. So let me figure out how to open this, my screen. Oh no. Okay, are they here in the questions or in the chat yeah. or? Yeah. 
it feels odd to be yes it, it's really strange to be aware of your breathing it's uncomfortable at first and um it's like you will feel what is called air hunger so because we're used to breathing through our mouths all the time and not used to breathing through our nose and if you have small a smaller nose at first it will be really uncomfortable and you will have to adjust but the more you do it it's just like any other activity the more you cycle the more you yoga the more you eat clean you get more used to it and it doesn't bother you anymore it's just training the body how to do something new yeah i got it plugged in <laughs> So companies that will sell O2 and oxygen bars is um, marketing. It's very simple. It's just marketing. How do I open this? Oh no. Can't figure out how to open. Ha, I did it. Okay, sorry guys. Um, it's marketing. If you have low doses of, if you have low levels of oxygen, it could help get your O2 level up, but we don't really need that much. So it really is just like, how can I take this item that doesn't cost me very much money? You're cutting out a little bit, so Jen. So as far as training, Cutting it. Are you on a laptop? Maybe you want to move just to Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Oh no. It's okay. That happens. Oh, your fault. Can you guys hear me? I don't know. Yeah, we can hear you. Let's see. Is this better? Okay. So, um, as far as training yourself to do nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, especially while sleeping, I have been doing two different things. So, um, some researchers suggest that you just use a little bit of scotch tape to tape your mouth shut, which <laughs> will only last you maybe two and a half minutes the first time around um, before you, it's just too uncomfortable and you won't really want to do that. So. Uh, you start there, honestly. You do that a couple of times. And then every day it will actually get, a, you'll, you'll go from doing it for a minute and a half to three minutes to five minutes before you realize that you don't feel that urge to pull the, you don't feel the urge to pull the, the tape off. The other thing I've done is actually gotten me some, um, there are these, I don't know if you guys remember Breathe Right strips and they used to pull your nose open, but now they right. have these little rubber that go up your nose and expand the nostril. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're not that comfortable. But I'm up to like two hours of sleep trying with them up my nose before I pull them out. Wow. So those are two ways that you can start training yourself to nostril breathe, especially at night. When you're paying attention during the day, it is actually easier at night because you're already more accustomed to doing the nostril breathing. Let's see. A lot of people say that wearing this mask makes you breathe too much carbon dioxide. Is that about the seat? Is that about the CPAP regarding the? Oh, the mask, the daily mask. Yeah, I was asking about. Um, yeah, the COVID mask. That yeah, we we're not getting the amount of clean, fresh air that we should be. And in an effort not to start any riots, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> But realistically, the benefit is, does not outweigh the cost. So you're not supposed to trim that nose hair. I mean, you should not trim it all the way. But if it's making its way down towards your lip to be a mustache, I would never discourage grooming. <laughs> Now, Steve, that doesn't mean you have to put fake nose hair on for the next Zoom call, okay? <laughs> I can see you doing that. <laughs> I'm still trying to get over taping up my mouth. They've been trying to get me do that my whole life. <laughs> you said it. You said it. I didn't. <laughs> I am was thinking it. I heard her. <laughs> Your mouth, yeah. <laughs> I needed that. <laughs> That's 
awesome. So don't yeah. trim too much nose hair, you're saying. Right. All, everything in balance. Everything in moderation. Okay. So, and then the last one I see is um, you can train your brain by smelling specific scents and aromas designated to, yes, that's why um, you can use things like lavender for children. Then when they get older, that scent, not only does it have the physical reaction of relaxing everything, you will already relate it with calm and relaxation and they'll go right to sleep. Right, right. And people also use it for dementia patients. Yes. Anything that is going to increase the circulation in the brain is going to be a great addition for people with dementia or any brain, TBI, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, anything that is affecting the brain. Anytime you increase that circulation, it's going to make a world of difference. And nasal breathing will help you do that for sure. And what I like about nasal breathing is that it's free and easy and everybody can do it. We're all already breathing. So it's not, you don't have to get into it like Zumba or yoga or Pilates. It's you're already doing it. What about like they, they market the, um, the oxygen for my, cause I get migraines. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about that and they market the oxygen for migraines. What do you think about that? Uh, they market a lot of things for migraines, which are very um, temporary. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, migraines, a lot of times you have a constriction of the blood vessel. When you add CO2 to the situation, the blood vessels relax. So I'm not really sure how oxygen would be the better benefit. But overall, a lot of times if we um, balance whatever hormone is out of whack, the migraines will go. And it's not always like female hormones. Sometimes it's balancing your insulin. Sometimes it's balancing your thyroid. And then the migraines, unless it's a dehydration, in which case you just have to drink water. But the day piercings, the oxygen, they're temporary and that's okay, the benefit. But I wouldn't... Again, it's not a permanent solution to the migraine. The migraine is telling it's just a symptom telling you that something else is wrong. Interesting. Wow. Jennifer, did you, you said a migraine is a symptom? Yeah, migraines wow. are just symptoms of the, yeah. the body is trying to tell you that something is going on, something else is going on. For example, if you're getting migraines, right before your cycle, right before your period, that's an estrogen or progesterone problem with the migraine. If you are <clears throat> getting them with food and it's more than one or two foods, if you're getting them regularly with food, then you have an issue with your digestion. Your gut is probably leaky or you need a probiotic, but the migraine itself is always just a symptom. The body's trying to tell you, hey, this needs attention. Wow. Wow. So like I said, if we correct the underlying condition, you don't, I used to get migraines three to four days a week. And now I might get one every two months, maybe. And it's usually because I have been eating terribly for a week and, and then I suffer for it. <laughs> when my checking account gets low, my wife gives me a migraine. <laughs> <laughs> so, Where's that scotch tape, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> goes back up. The migraine goes away. <laughs> so you can breathe through your nose. You put the tape on her mouth. You breathe through your nose. The migraine will pass. That's funny. Well, I notice I get them. I mean, I've had them for a long, for many years, but I'll get them a lot when I get upset. Mm. And so they'll come immediately. Probably your blood pressure. My blood pressure. Okay. Because mm -hmm. my blood pressure is pretty low, but. Right, but the increase in your blood pressure can trigger that, can trigger all of that tension. You'll get tension, tense in your face. You'll yeah. get tense in your shoulders and traps right up the back of your head and then into your eyes. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Good to know. I know I've been, I have experimented with uh, probiotics, probiotics, mm -hmm. and um, I've not had good luck with them. 
they make me, they always make me sick. But of course, I have a stomach problem. So um, I haven't been able to find one that I can take for a long period of time. And I know there's are supposed to be good for you. You might want to look at brewing your own kombucha or uh, you can do things like, kim I really like kimchi. I prefer ki eating kimchi or sauerkraut to taking any probiotic. I, first of all, I'm just unreliable with getting my pills taken. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that, but um, I would rather eat my medicine than actually have to take my medicine. So if you like a kimchi, a kombucha, a sauerkraut, any of those fermented foods, that might actually be better for you than trying to break down a pill and absorb that. That's good to know. And miso, miso is another good one. Oh, I love miso. There you go. You can make yeah. that your regular probiotic instead of trying to take a pill. And as long as it's not causing that, because a lot of times, depending on the kind of bacteria that's in the probiotic, it can make you feel a little bit bloated or change your bowels until your body adjusts to it, which is great for people who don't go regularly. But if you're already going regularly, that can upset your tummy. So food, if you, I, I always say, if you can do it with food, do it with food. Absolutely. And I, I totally agree with that because with my stomach problem, they wanted to put me on all kinds of medication and I just alter my diet instead. And that's much better than taking a pill every day. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it makes a word of, yeah, it makes, instead of taking the omeprazole, you want to take um, aloe, you want to take vinegar, which I know doesn't seem to make sense that you have too much acid and you're adding acid, but for whatever reason, that neutralize the acid in your belly and you stop having that discomfort. Lemon juice, juice works really well for alkalizing the body too in that instant. You can, you can have really low pH, test it, drink some lemon juice, immediately test it and your body will be alkalized. So that will also help the digestion. So it, it's, until we have a solution for everything. If you don't want to take a pill, this is where you need to be because we're going to keep you off the meds. But you start with the nose breathing because that's something everybody can do. <laughs>